Welcome, my name is Louise Taylor, I run the English Honours Programme and today I'm going to be giving you some information in order that you can decide further if you wish to submit your application for this programme. I'm assuming a certain amount of prior knowledge regarding the Dutch education system, so I'll jump straight into bilingual education in the Netherlands and I'll finish with an explanation of the assignment that you'll be doing. So bilingual education started in response to a movement from parents. The country itself needs trade to survive. We need a world language for communication. And this movement itself has also spawned FVTO and TPO, which are the primary school equivalents of um, bilingual secondary education. There are currently more than 130 bilingual schools in the Netherlands. The two main aims are to increase language, obviously, but also international orientation. Content and language integrated learning is, is the TTO method employed in the Netherlands. That is, language learning is not just in the language class, but also through other subjects. IO is Europees en Internationale Orientatie. Um, this is an integral part of school policy in the TTO curriculum. There's much more focus on international topics at bilingual schools than you'll encounter at non-TTO schools. TTO itself was developed by schools and not by the government. It's important to realise that. It's coordinated by the NUFIC, together with a national network who created the TTO standards and who are responsible for carrying out the TTO inspection. So the English teacher at a bilingual school is responsible not just for language and literature lessons, but also has to be available to support other subject teachers teaching in English. But there must be a dialogue. If there's something they need, they should be able to come to you. And if you see something, then you should also be able to go to them. The English teacher is often responsible at bilingual schools for finding or for providing CPD, as in continuing professional development sessions. And the English teacher often works with the subject teacher together on CLIL projects. Most subject teachers will have a good level of BICS and it's up to you as an English teacher to help them improve their CALP. The Netherlands is the only country in the world to have permission to use part of the IB exam, the English part. This comprises two possible levels, i.e. language A or language B. These are both divided into standard and higher levels. B, if you like, is um, language acquisition for pupils with some previous experience of learning the language as a second language or as a foreign language. While studying the language, pupils um, are also expected to explore the culture or the cultures connected to that language. A can be seen as the equivalent of what a native speaker would do, and it includes language and literature. The assessments take place around the May holiday in the Netherlands and then moderated externally by the IB, who also carries out random inspections of the programme at various schools. The results for the IB are then received in July. So CLIL, Content and Language Integrated Learning. This is what should be happening at TTO schools, at bilingual schools, whether FEMBO, MBO, HAVO or FEVIO. CLIL is an approach to teaching and learning where subjects are taught and studied through the medium of a non-native language. There are many types of CLIL around the world. Um, in the European model, content leads the way in the planning process. Language is seen as a tool and a medium. This means that traditional grammar chronology is not possible. You um, simply have to learn the grammar that is necessary at that time in that particular subject. The, le the level of cognitive challenge is actually the same as in the first language. So initially, many teachers focused purely on learning how to use the language. Through the CLIL concept, the focus has moved more towards using the language as the vehicle in order to learn the subject. This even applies to English teachers in a CLIL context. Yes, you do have to be able to know the language in order to use it, but like with first language learning, we construct both at the same time. The language itself isn't the aim, but the content. We learn the language through the content. That does not mean that the CLIL teacher should assume the language will be learned simply by hearing it, as we'll see in a moment. Here you see the four C's, content, communication, cognition, and culture. The fourth C is sometimes referred to as citizenship or community there. Content is the subject matter, communication, 
is obviously the language learning and use. Cognition is the learning and thinking process. Culture is about developing intercultural understanding and global citizenship. These together are the four aspects which must be in CLIL classes. Cooperative learning is vital to CLIL, as is the zone of proximal development. So in that respect, CLIL does not exclude things you may already have learned about good education. Rather, it takes them on board and adds to them. So the teacher's job is to create opportunities in class to engage pupils in meaningful communication at an appropriate level, both cognitively and linguistically. Rather than memorising new words and grammar rules, in a CLIL class, pupils now talk about important events, they do scientific experiments, and they solve maths problems using the additional language. Years of research has proven that systematic and explicit language instruction is important for proficiency as long as it's linked to pupil needs. This means that explicit language teaching is even more important when the additional language um, is being used to teach academic subjects. So we'll have a brief look at the three aspects of communication. Remember the four C's we mentioned uh, before? So this involves, as you can see here, the language of, or, and through learning. Okay, let's take a look at them now. So as you can see, if you read this, the language of learning quite simply comes down to the notions, the, the words, the chunks that it is that pupils are going to need for your particular subject. So what you see here is, I apologise for the bad slide, but the language of learning. So you have key vocabulary and phrases, the language of describing, defining, explaining, hypothesising, the grammatical progression and using modal verbs, for example, to predict the future. This is obviously an example of predict the future of ecos ecosystems, um, being able to use the future, the conditional tenses, etc., in order to talk about cause and effect and suggest solutions. So this type of language is referred to as the language of learning. The words, etc., and the type of specific gram grammatical um, constructions that you will need for that particular topic. Okay, so if you think about the language for learning, imagine I want two people to work together. They have to know how to discuss appropriately. They have to know, learn how to ask questions, perhaps have a debate, um, etc. So this type of language, it's not the specific language for my subject, the actual notions, if you like, but now we're talking in terms of Function. So what language will they need in order, to, in order to be able to carry out the tasks in my subject? So here you see ideas of the language for learning. The language, for example, of arguments and disagreements. The language you might need for project work. Written language, how do you write a simple research report for chemistry, for example? And of course, asking and answering questions. That is the language for learning. So it's not necessarily subject specific, but it is what I might need at this particular moment in this particular subject I'm studying. Okay, so the language through learning is not one necessarily that you can prepare as a teacher, but it is what pupils will learn whilst in your class. So for example, if I hear somebody giving a presentation, I may pick up certain terms of phrase that they use and think, hey, I'll incorporate that into my own presentation. Um, by discussing with a partner, I may pick up language that I didn't already know, that, but that the teacher hadn't deliberately taught me in that lesson. That is the language through learning. If we take a look at it a bit more closely, for example, dealing with feedback, using feedback, back, feedback can be uh, the language through learning. Improving your dictionary skills in class, you may have picked up on a few extra skills. Recycling discussions and by hearing things, each time improving your own level of a discussion and extending your presentation skills. So these are all things that can be incorporated and known as the language through learning. So the other C, culture or citizenship as it's sometimes called, um, should not just be thought of as going on an exchange to a foreign country. It's also about cultural awareness. Being aware, for example, of how you within your culture react to somebody else's culture. Um, 
the idea of culture actually comes all the way, it permeates, if you like, through all the other seas. It also comes through the language. If you think about um, the English culture, for example, the use of the please and thank you everywhere is something that is not the same in other cultures. If you think of the German culture, the, the very formal way of addressing people is specific to their culture, but it is part of their language use. So culture is something that's also very important in the CLIL environment. So how could culture be integrated into your specific class? Now, teaching geography, be it in the English class or be it in the geography class, talking about deforestation from different perspectives. What's happening around the world is, of course, an example of the cultural aspect. Um, landscapes, ecosystems, etc. Of course, you have the idea of linking up to a sister class, which is deliberately talking to other schools abroad. Then you can see the more obvious part of the culture there. Um, and engaging in peer reviews, even if you're talking about a certain project, engaging in peer reviews with a class from another school. And it doesn't even have to be from another country. If you're in a in a city school and someone else is out in the countryside somewhere, that is also quite a different culture, if you like. So the culture permeates all of CLIL. OK, so what's your assignment? What you're going to do is to make a vlog of a maximum of 10 minutes in which you provide some background information to one of the following topics, just one of them, and you explain why you would be suited to work there as an English teacher. So you're going to be looking at FEMBO or HAVO FEMBO or MBO, bilingual education. Um, so you tell us a brief bit about it and then why you yourself would be suitable for it as an English teacher. So in order to start off, I recommend you read the TTO Standarde, so the bilingual standards. You'll find them on the website for the NUFIC, NUFIC.nl. There's also lots of other information you can find there. For example, where are all the bilingual schools? Um, and also lots of information about bilingual schools in general. So you need to find out about the role of an English teacher in bilingual education. And as I mentioned Bix and Kelp previously, it may be worth looking into that. But that's entirely up to you. Ten minutes maximum. You're going to hand it in by June the 25th, 5 p.m. at the latest. And you'll hand it in via a link to YouTube, Vimeo, Google Drive or whatever. Make sure it's not set to public unless you're OK with having it set to public. But you'll hand the link in to me. I will make sure that my um, email address is put on this video for you to find somewhere. OK, good luck with it. And I look forward to seeing you on the Honours Programme next year.